Welcome to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. In this podcast, we will focus on successful marketing methods for advisors that generate prospects and clients. We will learn from the best in the industry on how advisors in the trenches today are growing their practices. Join us for this journey where Brad draws from years of expertise and guest experts to help advisors reach their full potential. Welcome back to Brad Swinehart's Be Advised Leading with Value podcast. Brad's guest this episode is Aaron Botsford. Aaron has been in the financial advisory world for 30 years and was a Barron's Top 100 advisor in all categories, advisor, independent, and women. She sold her practice in 2017 and is now an advisor coach with her Elite Advisor Success System and Spend the Day Mastermind programs. Brad, why don't you introduce us to Aaron? Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. You and I are, I think, best friends, or at least uh, top five <laughs> friends. Yeah, you know, we've we've done a lot, <laughs> we've done a lot of things together from virtual summits and and webinar series, and and I always enjoy just learning from you and listening to you speak. And and one of the things I wanted to to kind of kick off for our listeners today is, you know, how did you? get into the business. Let's let's talk a little bit about your history. We heard some of your accolades here earlier, but how did you start? What were some of those challenges that you overcame and, and how did you get into the business? Well, thanks for asking, Brad. Thanks for having me on today. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I had a pretty sordid past and we won't go into that. People can Google Aaron Botsford and find out all about my pretty awful upbringing and some of the tragedies that happened. But, um, you know, I got lucky and I was married to a man who I'm still married to 41 years later. And uh, he was an Air Force officer. And we moved 17 times in the first 14 years we were married. And, you know, that was good for me because I had been through a lot of personal tragedy and I was able to sort of reinvent myself every time we moved. And so, you know, interestingly enough, we were living over in Germany and I had spent the better part of my career up to that point, all of my 29 years in the title insurance business. So we're in Germany and all these people are wanting to come back to the United States and buy their first home, these these GIs. And I started a seminar um, and I started going all over to bases, all over in the, in Germany, USAFI they called it. And I was teaching people when you get back to the States, how to use your VA benefits to buy a home with no money down. So I was kind of early to the seminar business if you wanna know the truth. And it really did prepare me for the next part of my career. I also finished my degree. I went to the University of Maryland overseas campus and I went to night school. I mean, I tell people it took me 11 years and seven colleges to graduate from college because I I moved so much with my husband and I only went to night school. So I graduated from University of Maryland overseas. I built this little business over there just through sheer will. And then I came back to the United States in 1988. And truthfully, I I had no idea what I wanted to do. I So I went into a stock brokerage firm looking for a job as a secretary. And I, because I had no, I had, I had no confidence in my ability, even though I'd built a tiny little business over in Germany, it was in title insurance and real estate. I didn't know anything about stock brokerage world or anything like that. So I go in looking for a job as a secretary and this guy goes, Hey, um, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to make you a stock broker. I'm like, what? I mean, I didn't, I didn't know the difference between a stock, a bond. I never heard of mutual fund and ETFs didn't exist. Okay. So, so, you know, I'm like, okay. I mean, I was 29 years old and didn't know any better. And so three weeks later I was in St. Louis, you know, at a three week training program, I come back and boom, I'm a stockbroker. And so, you know, I, I struggled. I was in Panama city, Florida, which was the average per capita income in that entire town was $9,000 a year. Uh, so try making a living with people who have no money. And so, you know, I struggled. I struggled really badly for the first, I'm going to say 10 years. And the good news is at some point, my husband got out of the military. And in 1991, we moved to Dallas, Texas. And so he was, you know, he was going to fly for American Airlines. But again, I had started in 89. I moved in 91. So two years later, I'm starting all over again. But at least in this you know, in Dallas, Texas was a slightly larger um, metroplex, so there was more people. And so I did, the only thing I knew how to do, and that was I started building my business doing seminars because I had learned how to speak in front of people when we were living in Germany. So in a nutshell, 
you know, I started giving nighttime seminars, sometimes daytime seminars in the public library. Um, and I, I remember I would always pray for rain because if it rained, then then the guys would come, you know, I, would, I was targeting retired people. And so instead of going on, out and playing golf, you know, they would come to my seminars. And then I got a lucky break. And um, because I had, you know, I had built my business biz doing seminars, I got a call one day from a very, very large electronics company. And they were offering early retirements to 900 people. And they wanted to know, they had heard about me, they wanted to know if I would give a retirement seminar to all 900 people. And I was like, hmm, let me think about it. Like, nah, no thanks. That, that's not really my thing. <laughs> I did three seminars. I had 300 people at each, at each one. And literally they were wrapped around the building to set an appointment with me. But the problem, Brad, was, you know, I was working for a stock brokerage firm and they offered me no support. And I, I had a part-time assistant I shared with like four other brokers. And here I had this windfall, I had this opportunity of a lifetime and I didn't have the resources to capitalize on it. And I remember my husband, you know, he was, a, you know, he'd fly on, on the weekends and during the week he'd help me and I'd say, okay, you know, I'd call him up, I'd go, this guy, this couple has 800,000 and is a rollover. I mean, give him plan A and then this part-time assistant, I'm like, this couple has 600,000, you know, give them plan B. And I mean, it was just ridiculous. And you know, the, it was 19, I could say 1993. And, um, you know, I managed in, in spite of everything, I managed to bring in about $25 million over about a three month period, wow. which was, which was great until I found out that they had paid out $792 million. So what I realized was, you know what? I had the front row seat. I mean, I had the implied endorsement of the entire company, but I didn't have the resources to capitalize on it. So that made my decision. I I'd ended up going independent and I decided, you know what? You know, my stock brokerage firm wouldn't hire a you know, full-time assistant for me. They would give me minimal resources, which I thought was just incredible actually. I, I thought how short-sighted was that? So I ended up going independent where I could hire my own people. And so long story short is by the end of my career, I had <clears throat> two offices. I had one in Dallas, one in Atlanta. And my goal always was to have seven conference rooms filled with clients of our firm. And I was not in any one of them. So um, that's kind of the, the, the story in a nutshell. I love all, there's so many things that I want to pick out and focus on. And I know we don't have all day, but the one thing you said, you're praying for rain. I love that. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I thought that was great. And one of the things, you know, is, you know, that was really interesting is what you said is, you know, when you were first starting your business and you were really grinding it out and you weren't seeing success, a lot of that had to do with the, the geography, which, you know, nowadays with everything being so, adaptable to the virtual environment, that might not be an issue for advisors if they're willing to move online and, and do things virtually and, and close business virtually, that, that those types of issues are, are kind of a thing of the past. But Aaron, you and I first met because you were using White Glove to, to fill seminars and you had your coaching program and we were working with a few of your advisors and like hearing the history of how you learn to, to speak in front of a crowd and how you use that to catapult your success. Is there any tips you would say that, you know, for someone new to the seminar game or now virtuals, you know, doing webinars, what would you say is probably the most important thing when it comes to standing in front of an audience, you know, in person or virtually? Yeah. You know, one thing that I would say, I got very lucky, Brad, in that, um, when I got to Panama City, Florida, and I didn't know the difference between a stock, a bond, or a mutual fund, I had a mentor. His name was Hal. And, you know, Hal allowed me, he was building his business, giving seminars. And so I would go and I was, was pretending when it was his seminars, I was acting like his assistant and I was checking people in. But he was so kind and he allowed me just to literally copy verbatim everything that he said in his seminar. And so rather than reinvent the wheel and make it up, I sat there, I, I listened to the master, right? And I just copied him. And now Hal was unusual, especially in that time that he operated always out of a sense of abundance. Here, we were in this crappy little town where there weren't, there weren't a lot of wealthy people, but yet he still operated under this 
you know, sense of abundance and allowed me, one of his competitors, to just copy him. And so, Brad, that's part of what I've done, you know, 30 years later in, in my advisor, my, I don't even want to call it a coaching program. My program is all about modeling. And so I actually give a seminar and I tell people, just copy. I learned from a master. He let me copy him. So just copy what works, you know, say these words and these other people will respond accordingly. So, you know, I think so many advisors are out there. They're trying to reinvent the wheel. They make it up as they go along and somehow they think they're unique. The, the uniqueness is what will sell the day, but there really is a formula that works and use the formula. I followed, I had a master and now I, in turn, I am the master for a lot of people. And so I guess my best advice would be quit reinventing the wheel. I mean, that is a, that is a big problem in the financial services industry is because everybody wants to do their own thing and they're all independent. Well, sometimes that doesn't work out so well because you know what, you're, it's, sometimes it's just better to follow a formula that actually works. So that's what I would say is follow, find something that works and just do it over and over and over and over because mastery is all about, you know, perfection and perfecting the art of being in front of people and knowing body language and, you know, all of that stuff. So. And they say, if you, if you copy one person, it's plagiarism, but if you copy multiple people, it's research, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> well, if you copy it and they tell um, you to copy it, then you're being smart, you know? Oh. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I think you're spot on there is, you know, there's certain things that you just have to do that that works and, and reinventing the wheel isn't always the, the best approach, you know, on the white glove side of things when it comes to like marketing and events and, you know, virtual stuff and all the planning, you know, a lot of times we have advisors that come to us and say, hey, I want to do this one off thing or that one off thing. And it's, and it's hard to get them to realize, hey, just do this because we know it exactly. works. You know, we know if you go in this area and you talk about this topic, you're going to convert this many people. Like just follow, just add water and stir, exactly. right? We don't need your, we don't need your spices. We don't need your, you know, extra dash of vanilla. Just add water and stir and repeat. That's all you have to do. And I think that's so powerful that, that you've seen such success by doing just that, by modeling after other people that have been successful. Exactly. Well, let's talk a little bit. So you do a seminar, you get someone that's interested. I know you and I did a, um, a webinar earlier this year and, and one last year about how to connect with a household that comes in and sees you or now maybe meets you virtually. And I'd love to just spend a minute or two talking about that because I, I love that message that you have. So what would your recommendation be when, you know, when you're first meeting a household, how do you connect with both parties? Right. Well, you know, um, one of the interesting things about our industry is that it's, it's dominated so many, so much by males, male advisors. And I had a, a webinar that I used to do or a, a talk that I used to do, and I called it women have absolute veto power. And it's so funny because when I, whenever I explain this to a male, any male advisor who also happens to be married, they totally get it. Okay. And yet in their business, sometimes until I have pointed it out to them, they've never really thought about the fact that, you know, in a, let's call it a couple situation, whether they're married, not married, whatever, if you do not include the female in that relationship, you know, by the time you, you know, sign off on your Zoom call, or if it's an in-person meeting, by the time, you know, they get to the car and she closes the door, you're likely history. And so I know this from personal experience, you know, Bob and I were young, early married, and we were putting a pool in our backyard. And, you know, this was, gosh, I was just starting in the business and, you know, um, this pool guy wanted to talk about the pool pumps or something. And, you know, he insisted that I be there. And I said to Bob, you know, I don't need to be there. I don't want to talk about the pool pumps. You just take care of it. That's your bailiwick, you know, whatever. And he's no, he insists that you be there. And how many times have we as advisors, we always know some, for some reason, we have to insist that both the, you know, both parties and the couple be there. But what he did to me was just this aha moment. I'm so grateful he did it because it changed my life forever. I get home, I leave my office at four o'clock, I get home, he comes in, he's effusive and saying, oh, hello, Miss Botsford, so nice to know you. And, you know, and then we sit around the table, the kitchen table, you know, for two hours and he ignores me the entire time. And I thought, 
I, I, I can't even believe this is happening. This man insisted that I be in the meeting and he is completely ignoring me. And I was fuming and seething, but I thought, you know what? Maybe there's something I'm supposed to learn here. And surely there was. So, you know, we pick, you know, it's meetings over. We stand up, we go to the front door and he shakes Bob's hands and he shakes my hand. And he says, Ms. Bosford, it's been so nice to, you know, to know you and I've enjoyed our time together so much. And he's like, I'm so excited about putting your pool in, in his little Southern accent. And we closed the door and I just swiped my <laughs> hand underneath my neck and I'm like, ah. and Bob was completely clueless. I'm like, he goes, what do you mean? Ah. I go, we are not doing business with that man. He goes, what are you talking about? I mean, he's just spent two hours with us talking about the, you know, the, I go, I don't care if he spent two years with us. He insisted that I be here and then he ignored me. And, you know, I went on and on and on. And that was it. And what I had effectively done, and I didn't have a terminology for it back then, but I had exercised my absolute veto power. And for advisors, you know, if you insist, you know, and you should, you should have both parties in a relationship, in the meeting, on the call, in the Zoom call, whatever, but then you have to pay attention to and give equal time to the woman or you're gonna lose it. And, and I don't know why that is such a difficult concept for a lot of people to, to grasp, but I've seen it happen over and over. And then they wonder why they didn't get the business. Well, you ignored her or all you did was talk about golf or you know, the Dallas Cowboys or football or things that you, know, you, you were trying to connect to him thinking, well, he's the senior level executive at this big company. So what? She retains absolute veto power. And if you forget that, it's, it's at your own, you know, expense. So I, I can't stress that enough. And so, you, you know, you, yes, you have to have both parties in. If it's an in-person meeting, I always sit the woman at the head of the table, always. I give her a place of honor and I insist that my advisors do the same thing. And I, then I put him on the side of the table when he's looking at me, there's nothing behind me to distract him because men are easily distracted. Sorry, Brad, but that's the truth. <laughs> what, what were you saying? Yeah, I was yeah, sorry, yeah, I was yeah, looking okay. off at uh, something else, yeah. But the, the reason I, I say put her at the head of the table, one, she's uncomfortable being there, but putting her at the pl place of honor, the other thing that does, it helps that you don't accidentally ignore that she's there. You know, you get into these deep conversations and you're talking about this and you're talking about that. And it's so easy if she's just innocuously sitting on the other side of the table to forget that she's there and ask for her input. So sometimes we need little crutches to make sure that we, we include her. Cause she is, you know, like I said, she may not be the powerhouse and she may not be the whatever, but she is the ultimate decision maker in that relationship. I promise you that. Well, what's interesting is when you host a webinar or a seminar, you, you know, the really successful um, speakers know to hone their message to different audience types, right? right? where everyone in the audience is going to react a little bit different from, you know, you need a very tactical close. You need a very emotional close. You need to, you know, you walk them through different types of scenarios because you want to hit each type of person in that room. And then you have advisors that absolutely master that and they can hit all of the points so that you're pulling on the heartstrings over here. You're checking the boxes for the, the tactical thinkers over here and they book those appointments. And then they kind of throw that mentality out the window when they have that first appointment. And there's only two types of people in the room. And they say, well, I'm only going to speak to one of them. And it just doesn't make any sense. But what you're saying is, is very clear. You take that same mentality, but you make sure to speak with both people at the table. And then you're a hundred percent right on the veto power. I mean, that's, you know, I've, I've been in a long-term relationship and she absolutely vetoes anything that, <laughs> <laughs> that she's not, she's not interested in. So um, even, regardless of how, how excited I get. So yeah, it is. It's it's kind of an interesting phenomenon that we have in the world. But uh, I have I have not yet one met one male who uh, disagrees with that proposition. So, <laughs> do you think the same applies for um, when you're trying to get the family involved with decisions? Where you know you want the the kids involved with you know meetings with the parents so that the transfer of of wealth there that you can create that relationship. Do you think you can use a similar, similar mentality by bringing in the, you know, the adult children? 
Well, I always did do that. That was part of my process. Once we finished the estate plan, we always had a family meeting. And I would try and figure out who the alpha, the alpha child was. It was usually the firstborn. It was usually the male. Um, and so, but it, you know, it is important to include those. I, I think that um, I've never really taken my absolute veto power to that, you know, to that next generation. Because when you have this, there's, there's so much going on in a room when you've got 10 people in the room, yeah. then when you've got, you still have that, the head of household woman that wants to make sure her children are well taken care of. So. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, we're coming up to the, you know, a new, a new year of planning for advisors to seek growth. You know, this year has been rocky at best for a lot of advisors. You know, they're, their current marketing strategies maybe weren't as effective as they were in the past. You know, we've seen advisors adapt to the virtual world and see massive success. We've also seen advisors kind of bury their heads in the sand and wait for this to blow over. It's clear that nothing's blowing over and that, you know, the, the new environment that we're in is here to stay. So we can't call it that anymore. It's now just the environment, but how would you suggest, and I know you focus a lot of this on your, um, your modeling program, uh, not coaching program. <laughs> but how would you, you learn uh, quickly, Brad? I like that about you. <laughs> how would you suggest an advisor looks at, you know, we're coming into the end of the year, but beginning of next year, what does that planning phase look like? What should they be thinking about now or yesterday or three weeks ago, you know, to plan for a successful 2021? What does that look like? Well, let me start by saying, you know, to me, one of the things that made me successful was personal discipline. And I, and this is what I teach. And before we got online, we talked about the fact that I'm doing a year end planning webinar. I'm doing one on December 3rd, but I will also be repeating it on January 7th. So depending on when people listen to this audio, you'll definitely be invited on the January 7th to join. But one of the things that I feel is so important is I had a, a weekly discipline and I planned every week out. It was Sunday nights. And I kind of, when my son was growing up, I think about it. I was, my son was only five years old when I got in the business. And every Sunday night, I cooked the same meal. I had between 12 and 24 people over for dinner. And I made roast beef, mashed potatoes, gravy, and corn. And my rule is they had to show up by six and they had to be gone by eight with the dishes done. But it was something our family did. And because my husband traveled with American and I had two offices, it was just, kept our family very cohesive that we did the same thing every Sunday night. But then when those people were gone at eight o'clock from eight till sometimes midnight, I had a planning time. And then I would get up in the morning on Monday mornings. I was at my office by seven, seven thirty, And I was ready for my team to show up. I had a plan for, you know, everything that was going to happen because on Sunday night, my ritual is I would go through, you know, everything that had happened the week prior. I would look at the appointments coming up the next week you know, I had lists and lists and lists of things that I wanted to get done. And then I was waiting with the coffee brewed for my team to show up Monday morning. So in 31 years that I was in business, I never, never once did I not do that. And I never once was I not prepared on Monday morning. So that's a real key. And we're going to talk about that and some of the steps and things to happen if you want to, you know, really get a, gri a, a grip and a grasp on planning your next year. And then Every year in December, I took two days with my team and we did an offsite meeting. And we're going to be going through the steps of what we did at our offsite meeting. Because one thing I did, Brad, was I always had, I walked into the new year with a complete marketing calendar. And I actually give that calendar to my students, okay? And just say, again, don't reinvent the wheel because I, I had a communication plan if I was going to do seminars. And I think, you know, using webinars and seminars and technology now, like you said, there are no borders, there are no, there are no limitations. You could be doing, you know, webinars virtually to people in 50 states, right? And, and right now, if, if I were still in the business, this would be the most exciting time for me because I would capitalize while well, everybody was kind of like shrinking and hiding in their basement, I'd be out there just killing it, right? And so that's what I try and impart to my students. And so in, you know, in my two day retreat, I would walk away at the end and I would have a complete plan for the next year. And all we had to do then was execute on the plan. And so I'll be talking about that again. I'll just say January 7th, we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, put the link in so people can join us on January 7th because it is the most important training I do. In fact, it, interestingly enough, it's not even in my course 
which we finally figured out, I was like, why isn't this in our course? Well, I want everybody in December to be thinking about and planning for the next year. Some years when I was just scrambling to get, you know, especially when I was newer in the business, I didn't have the luxury of two days in December because I was trying to, you know, close out a lot of business, but I would take the first two days in January. And in my case, way back in the day, I would literally just go to IHOP. I went to IHOP for two days. And I would sit there and tell them, this is what I'm going to do. Can you leave me in this corner booth by myself? I'd give the morning shift a $20 um, tip and the afternoon shift a $20 tip just to leave me alone. Because I just needed to have time to sort of evaluate what had happened in the last year, what worked, what didn't work. In fact, I give, you know, I'll be giving everybody that comes on this couple of worksheets. One's called the Keep, Stop, Start worksheet, which is what should we keep doing? It works so well, we want to keep doing it. What should we stop doing? It was a disaster. It didn't work at all. And what should we start doing? What new initiatives do we want to put out there? So it's a really jam-packed, it'll probably be an hour and a half training, but I hope people will do it because, you know, just really getting clarity on what you want to do in the next year is, I think, like 90% of the battle. And, and I think that's really important is having a marketing calendar and having the discipline to stick to it. You know, a lot of the advisors that I've spoken with in the past or that we work with, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't know if you've seen this in your practice as well, Aaron, but they have this shiny object mentality where they try this and they try this and they try this and they don't stick to it to find out if it's actually working and, and tracking it. The most successful advisors we work with, they book out a whole year of seminars and webinars and they just, you know, they might reevaluate six months in, eight months in, but they, they know it's a process and they know that, hey, I have to be committed to this in order to see success. And, and that for an advisor, I think is more beneficial than, you know, you have to have a, a flexibility and a, a willingness to adapt. Obviously this year taught us that if it didn't teach us, teach us anything else, but committing to that process, as opposed to just jumping from one to the next to the next, you'd never find out what actually works. And I love that. Uh, that mentality of this works, let's keep it this, let's stop this and let's start something new. I, I love that. I think that's great. And really, I just have um, two final questions for you here, Aaron, is, you know, a lot of the things that you mentioned is such show, showcases such strong leadership with your team and how you progress in the business is, is really like coffee Monday morning at 730 that I know that my boss is going to be there. They're ready to go. Like that consistency would set the tone for the office. And for that leadership role, you know, a lot of advisors are getting into the business because they love what they do. And then they get thrust into this position of leadership and they, they don't know quite how to handle it and how to run a business. If you had one key thing to say, Hey, you know what, you're now a leader. This is what you have to do. Um, what would that be for a new advisor that's now all of a sudden in, in charge of a team? Well, there's where's the, there's that old saying, leaders lead. And so to me, if I had to impart one thing, it's this Sunday night discipline. Come, you know, get get your act together, review the week prior, review all your notes, and then all you have to do is come in on Monday morning prepared. And they will take their cues from you. And if you come in, in fact, I was talking, I, I was on another podcast and it was a, with a very famous celebrity, okay? And she has started a new business. And when we got off the podcast, when I, because I said a, something I felt like that made me really successful was just that Sunday night discipline, okay? But it was a discipline and I never not did it. I mean, if people are going out to dinner and they're going to the football game or they're going whatever, I did not go, okay? That's the commitment I made to myself and to my business, Right. And when she, she was like, oh my gosh, I can't even remember. She, she was like ruffling her hair. She goes, I come, you know, screeching into the office at about 11 o'clock on Monday. And her team was on this follow-up call with me too. And they were looking like, no wonder we don't ever get anything done. No wonder, you know, no wonder our business is failing. And, you know, she, she, when you come screeching in at 11 o'clock, completely unprepared, what, what do you expect? And so what was super cool, because I just did this webinar for her last Tuesday night, and on Monday morning of this week, she sent me a text message and she said, had my Sunday night discipline, I'm at the office right now. I'm like, I was so proud of her, you know? So That's you awesome. Something so simple as a Sunday night discipline and getting up Monday and being where you're supposed to be, even if it's on a virtual call, being there before your team 
It's magical. And it doesn't take much more than that, Brad. And so the, the fact that people haven't figured it. that out is kind of amazing to me. I mean, I thought everybody did that, <laughs> well, you know, but I find out that well, they I don't. That, so. I think this industry is just unique that you get into it um, to learn how to do one thing, you know, help your clients, you know, help them retire. And then you very quickly realize you have to be a business owner. You have to be an entrepreneur. You have to be a leader. You have to be a manager. And it, none of those skill sets necessarily, you know, you get advisors to try to be marketers. You know, obviously that's why white glove exists, but it's, it's just a, it's a, a huge all of a sudden it's this huge um, business that you have to start and run. And not everybody has all of those, um, those traits, those, those strengths. So to learn some of that basics, you know what, get there before your team, you know, that it could be as simple as that, get there before they get there, you know? And, and I love that. And I always had that mentality when I was a manager, I want to be there first and I want to be there last because, you know, you, you set that tone of, Exactly. This is this is the work that needs to be done, and it's important. And then one final thing, and then we'll we'll wrap up here. Thank you so much for for being on, Aaron. I just have to ask: you spent two days at IHOP. You know what was the pancakes like? How much syrup did you burn through? Like, I really need to understand. Like, was it just nonstop coffee? Like, that's how I would do it. I'd probably drink sixteen pots of coffee in two days if that if they just kept refilling it. I just need to know what that looked like, and then we could wrap up. It was coffee in the morning and Diet Coke in the afternoon. <laughs> That's, yeah, that sounds like I my diet. I love it. Girl, so, you know, the pancakes at IHOP were just, they were very tempting, but, you know, I would have been 300 pounds by now. So, yeah, lots of coffee, lots of Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a stronger person than me to sit and I out for two days and not eat, <laughs> not eat a pancake. So, but, <laughs> well, Aaron, thank you very much for being on. I thought this was absolutely wonderful and and well, for sure, you know, I, I'll probably tune into your, your January event because I want to learn how to make, you know, 2021 the best year of my life as well. Great. So we'll thank you very much. You. Maybe we can do something together next year. And or do, I'm sure we'll do a bunch of things. Oh, oh, you know, we will. You know, we will. <laughs> well, thanks, Brad, for having me. Appreciate it. Yes, Brad, you definitely need to get Aaron back in because a big yes, Aaron, on your spot on life observations. As a woman, especially in finances in the home, you got it, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. Brad Swinehart of White Glove and advisor coach Aaron Botsford. To know when more of Brad's Be Advised Leading with Value podcasts are available, subscribe to this podcast with the subscribe button on this page. And of course, you can share with friends and colleagues using the share button. Thank you for listening to Be Advised Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of White Glove. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.